Good evening. I'm Gretchen Crosby Sims, and I'm the executive director here at the Institute of Politics. It's an exciting day at the IOP, and not just because it's David Axelrod's 29th birthday. <laughs> Today, we're honored to welcome the 29th US Permanent Representative to the United Nations, Ambassador Nikki Haley. I want to thank the International House for partnering with us to host the ambassador's first visit to a university campus since taking office. We are honored. As many of you know, this year marks the fifth anniversary of the Institute of Politics. This quarter in particular, which has included a visit from Prime Minister Justin Trudeau of Canada, and will conclude next week when we partner with WBEZ and Politico to host a forum with all six candidates for the Democratic gubernatorial race, we have had many opportunities to reflect on our mission, which is igniting in young people a passion for politics and public service. Through our speaker series and our fellows program, we promote the respectful exchange of ideas on critical national challenges, opportunities, and debates. Through our internships and civic engagement programs, we equip the next generation of civic leaders to realize their visions of a better world. You can learn more about us at our website, politics.uchicago.edu. In all, we exist to inspire and empower young people, and it is in this spirit that we welcome Ambassador Haley to campus. Earlier, she met with students in our Women in Public Service program for an incredible honest discussion, and now we all get to hear from her. After giving remarks, Ambassador Haley will sit down for a conversation with Institute Director David Axelrod. He will be asking questions from our students, along with a few of his own. But first, to formally introduce Ambassador Haley is Sean Morrow. Sean is a PhD candidate in political science from Naperville, Illinois, who has been a regular attendee at speaker series events and fellow seminars at the IOP for the past three years. Beyond his coursework, he serves as an active duty lieutenant colonel in the United States Army. And this June, he will take command of the United Nations Security Battalion on the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. So we thought he was the perfect person to introduce Ambassador Haley. Please welcome me, uh, please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Gretchen. Good evening and welcome to the historic International House. It's a great pleasure for the Institute of Politics and for the University of Chicago to host Ambassador Nikki Haley. Ambassador Haley is our 29th permanent representative to the United Nations. In that capacity, she also serves on both the President's Cabinet and on the National Security Council. A proud daughter of Indian immigrants, she was born and raised in South Carolina. Ambassador Haley entered the workforce when she was 13. After graduating from Clemson University, she continued to help grow her parents' small business, and in 2004, was elected as the president of the National Association of Women Business Owners. Ambassador Haley brought that business acumen to governance and made history in 2010 in the governor's race by becoming the first woman and the first ethnic minority elected to lead the state of South Carolina. While driving unemployment to 15-year lows and increasing jobs in all 46 counties, Ambassador Haley also led education reform to ensure a more equitable distribution of education funding to the state's poorest communities. On January 25, 2017, she was sworn in as the United States Ambassador to the UN. In this role, Ambassador Haley is focused on the protection of international human rights. She's focused on the security of the United States and its interests, and on organizational changes leading to more efficient UN operations around the world. She also led the recent negotiations for unanimous Security Council approval of stringent new sanctions to counter the growing threat from North Korea. In sum, Ambassador Haley has lived a life of service. It's been fostered by experience in business, governance, and diplomacy. She brings those skills now to the most difficult puzzles in international relations today. Tonight, Ambassador Haley will first provide remarks on the current challenges and opportunities at the United Nations. And then we'll have a discussion with David Axelrod, the founder and director of our Institute of Politics. With that, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Nikki Haley. Thank you so much, Sean. I have such a great respect for him. You know, as a military wife, the sacrifices you make when 
your spouse deploys and goes to areas that are challenging, um, there's nothing like it. So please thank your family as well and stay safe. And I'm going to take a moment of personal privilege, if that's okay. I have a very special guest with me today, um, my Uncle George. Uncle George Haley um, taught here for almost 40 years um, in Romance Language section. And so I, if you'd stand, Uncle George, I'd love for everybody to welcome you. It really is great to be here, and I look forward to sitting down um, for a conversation with David as well in a few minutes. Before I do that, I want to speak with you about the United Nations and the approach we are now taking toward it. The history of the United States at the United Nations is a mixture of idealism and realism. The UN was created by both impulses. The ideal was that the UN would be the place where all the nations of the world came together to work out their differences without resorting to war. But the reality was that the UN was designed so that most of the power resides with a small group of nations. The Security Council has, five, has 15 members, five are permanent members, US, UK, France, Russia, and China. And the 10 others rotate every two years and are elected by the UN General Assembly. The five permanent members of the Security Council are the only ones that hold veto powers, which allow them to stop any resolution. Since its founding, American attitudes toward the UN have shifted between idealism and realism. Some presidential administrations have been more comfortable with the multilateral approach to foreign policy, encouraging the UN to play that hoped-for role as the place where nations come together to determine international policies. Other American administrations have been appropriately skeptical of the UN and less willing to cede our national control. As US ambassador, I've tried to focus on something else, showing value in the UN to the American people. It's very important to me for the American people to know what the UN does, the good and the bad. So I've tried to use my role as ambassador to tell the truth. I've used it to show American strength in sometimes frustrating situations, and I've used it to benefit the United States and advance our foreign policy interests. Sometimes our interests are financial. Sometimes they're security driven. Sometimes they're promoting our humanitarian and human rights values. The United States is by far the largest financial contributor to the United Nations. That doesn't mean we should always get our way but it does mean we should get something in return for our investment. Whether that something is feeding and clothing refugees in South Sudan, vaccinating children in Haiti, or isolating the rogue regime in North Korea, our participation in the UN should produce something of value. Because if we don't get a return on our investment, then we shouldn't be part of it. That's why it's so frustrating when the UN becomes a forum for America bashing. When that happens, everyone's time and effort is being wasted. My predecessor, Jean Kirkpatrick, called this the UN's Turkish steam bath, a place where countries get together to let off steam. But that's not what the UN was meant to be. So the idealist in me, coupled with the former accountant in me, looks for ways that we can act collectively with other countries to produce value for our people, our principles, and our security. Those opportunities do exist. With our contribution, UN agencies like the World Food Program, we have saved tens of millions of lives, lives that almost assuredly would have been lost without coordinated international efforts. North Korea is another area where the United Nations has brought value to the United States in the last year. The Kim dictatorship devotes most of its resources to its nuclear and missile programs that threaten us, while allowing its own people to starve. After 25 years of failed bipartisan attempts to bribe the North Koreans into ending their nuclear pursuit, we realized that we have to stop the revenue streams that support it. In the last year, the Security Council has unanimously passed three major, increasingly comprehensive sanctions packages against North Korea. 
the resolutions ban all North Korean exports, 90% of their trade, 30% of their oil, and we are essentially closing down North Korea's lucrative foreign labor program. Under U.S. leadership, the Security Council has sanctioned North Korea more harshly than any country in a generation. There is no other multilateral forum that could have achieved this kind of international unity. And even though North Korea has yet to end its nuclear and missile programs, we know the sanctions are having a real impact. The regime has less and less money to spend on its ballistic missile tests and less capacity to threaten other countries with those tests. It is in this fact, more than anything else, that prompted the Kim regime to reach out to South Korea and do public relations damage control at the Olympics. Their sources of revenue are drying up. Sending cheerleaders to Pyeongchang was a sign of desperation, not national pride. The problem at the UN, though, is that for every North Korea where we've had effective multilateral action, there's a Syria where the Security Council has been unable to condemn the gassing of children thanks to one country, Russia. That is where idealism runs into the brick wall of realism. There are many countries at the UN, including some of the most powerful ones, who simply do not share our values. They don't share our commitment to freedom and democracy and human rights. If we stay true to our values, then have a hard time coming to agreement with nations that don't share our values, morally and intellectually, that's not a bad thing. In fact, that's the way it should be. If we got along great with everyone at the United Nations, we would be signing off to a lot of really bad things. But it creates a dilemma for a democracy. As U.S. Ambassador, I am accountable to the American people in what I say and what I do. My colleagues from undemocratic nations are under no such constraints. They are accountable to governments that are not accountable to their people. The only principle that guides them is power. America is not at the UN to minimize our influence in the world. We're there to maximize it. It's how we seek to maximize our influence that makes the difference. The UN works best when it's guided by the principles of the rule of law and by an inherent dignity of every human being. That's another way of saying that the UN works best when the United States is not afraid to lead it. So delivering value for the American people means leading on behalf of American principles. What does that mean exactly? Ironically, sometimes it means not being afraid to stand alone. When we stand alone in calling out the Castro dictatorship in Cuba, our critics like to say that we are, quote, isolated, like that's a bad thing. But I have no problem being isolated in defense of what is right. By fighting for the voices of innocent people in terrible situations, we will always do the right thing. As a matter of fact, I see it as my duty to do so. Here's another example. Every month, for many years, the Security Council has held a meeting entitled Middle East Open Debate. That title would lead you to think that any of the many tough issues in the Middle East were on the agenda. You might think that but you'd be wrong. Every month, the Security Council has convened this meeting and talked about one thing, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I call it the Israel bashing session. This has gone on every single month for decades. It was ingrained in the culture at the UN when I arrived. Now, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a serious issue, but it's far from the only one in the Middle East so we decided to challenge it. We decided we were gonna talk about other important issues in the Middle East during those meetings. Things like Iran's human rights violations and support of terrorism, or Hezbollah's illegal weapons in Lebanon, or the half a million people that are dead and five million refugees coming from Syria, or the continued threat posed by ISIS, or the humanitarian disaster in Yemen. We were told we couldn't do it, that we couldn't talk about these issues during the session, but we did it anyway. And at first, we were alone. 
But then some other countries began to address other Middle East issues as well. And soon, we began to change the culture at the UN that badly served the American people. There's still a lot of work we have to do, but we've challenged the conventional wisdom that said the Security Council had to waste time every month scapegoating America's best ally in the Middle East. We've attempted to change the culture at the UN in other ways as well. We've pushed efficiency and effectiveness while reforming peacekeeping missions. We've taken on the waste and bureaucracy that is so deeply ingrained. Above all, we've emphasized actions in the United Nations, not just words. A year ago, this April 4th, the Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad sent his warplanes out to drop bombs containing sarin gas on the Syrian village of Khan Shaykhun. The sarin killed over 80 civilians in one of the worst ways imaginable. A dozen children literally suffocated to death in their own body fluids. A few hours later, Assad targeted the hospitals that were caring for the injured with a second round of airstrikes. The next day in the Security Council, Russia stood in the way of a resolution condemning the attack. They have a history of covering up for Syria. We had a choice to make. We could let Russia use its power to stop all international efforts to demand accountability for the barbaric use of chemical weapons, or we could do something about it, even if that meant doing it alone. Just hours after the Security Council failed to act, 59 U.S. Tomahawk cruise missiles struck the airbase from which Assad had launched the chemical attack. They got our message. And multiple ambassadors reached out and told me it was so good to see the United States lead again. The problem of the Assad regime was not solved by the U.S. response, but our action laid down a terribly important marker. We weren't going to stand by quietly and watch this dictator shred the international standard against the use of chemical weapons, and we weren't going to allow Russia's lack of principle to keep us from defending our principles. That's a lesson the Assad regime would be wise to continue to keep in mind. The United Nations Charter commits all its members to the pursuit of peace and security based on the equal rights and self-determination of all people. In practice, the UN has always fallen far short of that ideal. But the more the United States leads on behalf of those principles, both in and out of the UN, the closer we come to living out the noble intentions of the Charter. And the closer the UN comes to living up to its ideals, the more value it delivers to the American people and the world. Maybe it's just the idealist in me, but I think that's a good thing. I want to close today on a note about leadership, not just at the UN, but in our politics and on our college campuses. As U.S. Ambassador, I have gotten to know former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. One of the best pieces of advice Dr. Kissinger gave me is one that helped me make, is one that helped make him one of the most important foreign policy thinkers of the last century. It is advice that I had also known in a very different setting when I was Governor of South Carolina and we were able to get agreement to remove the Confederate flag from our State House grounds but it's advice I had not previously thought about in relationships between countries. The advice was simply this. Put yourself in your adversary's shoes. Understand what he or she wants and use that to guide your negotiations. You don't have to agree with them. Most of the times you won't, but you have to understand where they're coming from. This is a skill that I'm afraid is being lost in America today. Real leadership is bringing people around to your point of view by showing how it is in their best interest to do so. But on many college campuses, as well as in our politics and in our media culture, just the opposite seems to be the goal. There seems to be more of an inclination to seek virtue in our differences than to build on what we have in common. That can be a recipe for an endless conflict. Far too often, we are inclined to see those who disagree with us as not just wrong, but pure evil. 
in the last year working in depth in foreign relations, I've seen true evil, and it's not in the American political system. In South Sudan, where rape is routinely used as a weapon of war, that's evil. In Syria, where the dictator uses chemical weapons to murder innocent children, that is evil. In North Korea, where the depraved regime forces its own citizens into slave labor and tortures American student Otto Warmbier, that is evil. For those of you who are interested in American politics and thinking about a career in public service in our country, I urge you to remember that your political opponent, opponents are not your enemies, and they are not evil. They are just opponents. Take it from me. There's a big difference. Thank you so much for having me today. Thanks, Ambassador, for those remarks and for, for being here. We're honored to have you. I and just want to please say happy birthday to David. <laughs> it's his birthday today. What actually happened was she learned it was my birthday and asked if she could come out and be a part of the celebration. So I, I, I really appreciate it. thought you'd want to celebrate together. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to acknowledge uh, a, a few other uh, people. Beth Myers, uh, who is on our board, a great member of our board of the Institute of Politics. Uh, John Lerner, who is the deputy ambassador and a graduate of the University of Chicago Law School. So welcome back. And Congressman Peter Roskam is here as well, and we welcome you. Thank you for being here. So I want to start, uh, this being Illinois, with a quote from a predecessor of yours and a favorite son of, of our state, uh, Adlai Stevenson, who said, the whole basis of the United Nations is the right of all nations, great or small, to have weight, to have a vote, to be attended to, to be a part of the 20th century. I think he would say he wouldn't mind if we applied it to the 21st century as well. Let me uh, ask you this question then from uh, Jordan Scheimer, uh, who is in the class of 2018. How would you respond to a critic who claims that making foreign, and de uh, foreign aid dependent on support for UN votes makes the UN as an institution more transactional? The UN's strength is in its ability to foster discussion and drive consensus but how can this happen if the U.S. is seen as buying votes and strong-arming allies? So it, it, what I will tell you is if you think about putting an investment into something and you want to invest in something you believe in, you don't expect that to come back and bite you. So what we're saying is we're not buying votes. There's going to be countries that never vote with us. But at the same time, we should be investing in those countries that are trying to work with us that are trying to improve the world through our values and our eyes and do that. We're always going to be good uh, humanitarian donors. That's who we are. That's America at its core. But we don't have to do it to those that every time we turn around, they are bashing the United States. That's where you have to draw the line. And so what we're saying is it's not by one vote. It's not by a number of votes. But it is a consideration that we should have in any dealings where we have to invest in a country we should look at that as part of what we do, just to make sure that we're putting our investment in, in places that actually value our people. You were pretty tough on, uh, on your uh, fellow ambassadors before the vote on Jerusalem. And you made this point very clearly. You said we're, we'll be what, essentially taking names. We were taking uh, names. On this vote. Uh, in that, on that vote, uh, some of our closest allies voted against uh, the U.S., uh, f the French, the British, uh, among them, the Germans. Um, what, what was your reaction to that? And does that uh, w weaken your resolve about uh, working with them and investing in them and doing things together with them? No, I, you know, that's one factor that we always have to remember. I will tell you that I expected a Security Council meeting dealing with the move of the embassy. The part that I didn't appreciate and made it very clear was when they turned around and wanted to do another vote in the General Assembly. And keep in mind, all we were doing 
was following what Congress passes over and over again, where the American people say, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, and we were putting our embassy in the capital like we do so many other embassies. We always put them in the capital. So this was our decision. We didn't say anything about defining the borders of Israel. We didn't say anything about the peace process. That's for the Israelis and the Palestinians to decide. So when that vote came, I actually thought we were going to have maybe two or three with us. We had 68 that didn't vote against us. And Not I, nine voted with you. Nine voted with us, but the we rest had, abstained. But we had they either abstained or no didn't right, vote. No, but among those who you're counting in that number, right yeah. because they saw that this was America bashing. They saw this for what it was. They knew that that resolution didn't change one thing. It wasn't going to stop us from putting our embassy. It wasn't going to change anything that we had done. They did it just to humiliate us. And so when you see things like that, where people proactively are hating on America for something that they have no basis to do that on, and especially when it's our right to decide where our embassy is going to go, that's when you have to, those votes do matter. Because it's one of those where you, know, you expect your friends to stand with you. You expect your allies to be there. And so everything is not going to be defined on that one vote. But we did take names because that was a resolution that did nothing but try and humiliate the United States. And that's something that's very, very important. We always have to stand up for American values. But, but in fairness to, to those countries, including our close allies who voted uh, against us, this was a dramatic shift in American policy. Uh, presidents, Republican and Democrat, uh, who uh, preceded this president, all had the same policy, which was to uh, keep our uh, embassy in, in Tel Aviv because the status of Jerusalem is so central to the prospect of negotiating some sort of peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And the feeling was this should all be determined by negotiation, and we should uh, await those negotiations rather than unsettling, uh, unsettling the situation. Tom Friedman wrote a column in the Times, which I'm sure you wrote. And he said the thing that disturbed him was that this was a matter of great interest uh, on the part of the Israelis. And rather than using it as leverage to, uh, to, to get some concessions to move the peace process along, uh, we simply made that shift. You know, I think that those that want to think we made that shift are going to think that are going to think that way. But I'll go back to the American people. We serve the American people. Congress had overwhelmingly voted to name Jerusalem the capital of Israel and to put our embassy in the capital. Congress had just voted on that and had done it for many years. So do you defy the American people just because we're doing something we've done for years, which hasn't helped the situation? Or do you say, this is our stance. We're going to work on a peace process with you, but this is what the American people want. And I will tell you, those countries were very nervous because they know, especially in our democracy, we're always going to side with the American people. We're always going to do what they say to do. And I think multiple presidents um, struggled with it out of the whole fear doctrine that the sky was going to fall. The sky's still up there. It didn't fall. And now what we have is a time where the negotiations can start between Israelis and Palestinians. The, the negotiations and the ultimate peace process is not going to be what the United States wants. It's what Israel and the Palestinian Authority decide they want. They're going to have to decide borders. They're going to have to decide property. They're going to have to decide how all of that plays out. What the role of the United States is going to be, Jared Kushner and Jason Greenblatt have been the negotiators with both sides. They are coming up with a plan. The plan won't be loved by either side, and it won't be hated by either side, but it's a template to start talking. When are we going to see that plan? I think they're finishing it up. I mean, I, they're still going back and forth. But the way they've come up with that plan is by listening to Palestinians and listening to Israelis. And then when you do that, you're actually making sure you're hearing both sides and what they want. And so I think we, it, the other side of that is, I think with the passage of Resolution 2334, which basically hit Israel again uh, a year ago, what we're saying is, 
Every time you talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, every time you have a vote like this, you are splitting up the two sides. Our goal is to bring them together, and all you're doing is getting them more angry at each other, and that's not helpful. Uh, let me, uh, on this subject, here's a question from Jacob uh, Biederman, class of 2021. Uh, last year, the administration drew controversy in announcing its plan to move the Israeli embassy to Jerusalem. The Israeli-Palestine conflict, no matter how close to resolution it has come time and again, seems sometimes to be endless. Do you see a peaceful resolution in sight, and what does it look like? One state, two state, or are we cursed to fight this fight forever? No, I think it's a great question. It's for them to decide. So if they decide on a two state, the United States is going to support a two-state. If they decide on certain boundaries, the United States is going to support those boundaries. So if they, but, you're, you're, but you're com you'd be comfortable with a one-state solution. In other words, it would be hard pressed for me to see how they would want that. I mean, I, I think that they both are pushing towards a two-state solution. We're just going to support whatever they decide they want to do. And I think that look, I do have hope. I do have faith because. The Palestinians deserve better, and the Israelis deserve better. And right now, the way things are, they're in conflict. It's not good. It's not a good situation to be in. If the leaders would put aside their pride and their egos and think about their people and improving the quality of life for their people, this peace process will do that. That's what we hope to accomplish. There's been this enormous proliferation of settlements and building uh, uh, which has been a nor an enormous uh, uh, accelerant in the hostilities between uh, both sides. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has said that those uh, settlements uh, uh, in, on the West Bank are now part of Israel. Do you view them that way? Well, first of all, we've always said settlements are not helpful. At this point, when we're trying to get a peace process, it's not helpful. Having said that, the settlements that he is following through on are prior to what we have said we were going to do going forward. So they have said they're going to hold off on um, settlements going forward. I hope they do that because it only, again, angers the situation. Um, I want to ask you, you mentioned uh, human rights mm -hmm. in, your, in your remarks. How do you weigh human rights uh, against other strategic imperatives? Uh, for example, you've spoken here about uh, human rights violations in Iran, but not in Egypt or, or Saudi Arabia, who are U.S. allies. How do you weigh those two things and, uh, and take a, a consistent position? I think we're always for human rights, and we're always for the human dignity of all people. And so that's part of who the, who, you know, what the United States is, and I think other countries expect that of us. So we always raise it with them. I think that with the Saudis, we were um, pushing them, and it's nice to see that they have now, they're allowing women to drive, which is great, but I hope they go a lot further with that, and we'll keep telling them that they need to go much further than that. Human rights is always going to be right there at the top. We're never going to look the other way when it comes to human rights. But there, there's plenty to criticize Iran about, for example, but uh, when you look at Egypt versus Iran in terms of democracy, and elections and so on, it's, it's hard to say that Iran is, is, is worse than Egypt. We have no problems criticizing Egypt as well. We'll criticize anyone that doesn't take care of their people. And do you think that's the case with Egypt? I think it depends. You know, every country, look, we're not perfect when it comes to human rights. They're not going to be perfect when it comes to human rights, but we're not going to back down. I'm happy to say we're better than Egypt. We're better than Egypt. Yeah. And I think we have to continue to remind Egypt that we don't agree with the way they do things in the same way we do with Saudi Arabia and the way we do with Iran, and we'll keep doing that. Um, I, I want to come back to Iran in a second. Here's a question from uh, Kirk Lancaster, the class of uh, 2018. As new cases of the Assad regime using chemical weapons emerge, there are growing questions about whether Syria's actions and the lack of serious response by other countries are eroding the global consensus against chemical weapons and damaging broader norms and institutions that underpin the international system, who will hold Assad to account for chemical weapons? It, it is really such a tragedy what is happening there, because these are innocent civilians who are being gassed and um, injured and dying over there, and it's getting worse. It's not getting better, and I think the worst part for us, and I think for the international community, was when we had a vote. There was a 
Russia and the United States actually came together a few years ago on a mechanism that would hold any country that used chemical weapons accountable, any country, any group. And we did that together. And the Russians were great with it until it criticized someone they like. So here they had no problems when that mechanism criticized ISIS. They totally agreed with the mechanism. But when the mechanism suddenly criticized the Syrian regime, they said it was a fraud. So the thing is, you can't have a mechanism and only like the ones that you like and not like the others. They killed that mechanism. So when we had the vote this year, they vetoed it. So now we don't have that anymore. And we have to make sure we always hold chemical weapons abusers um, to account. We you, have you to. You mentioned the president struck Syria uh, after a previous chemical weapon attack. We've seen new evidence of the use of chemical weapons. Uh, it, uh, do you see further unilateral action on the part of the United States? I think that this is something we're always going to watch. We're trying to get all the countries to acknowledge. Right now, you've got so many hands in Syria's pot. So you've got the Syrian regime, you've got Russia, you've got Iran, you've got us there. You're starting to see Turkey come into that. What we have to do is make sure that they all understand chemical weapons for any reason whatsoever cannot be used in this situation. Russia has covered for Assad many times. We now have to decide what's the response to that. The mechanism that we had, they've just killed. So we've got to come up with so some So military other. option is a, is a live option? You know, it's, military options are always going to be on the table for any situation. But I think we also have to understand we don't want to be in the center of the Syrian conflict, but we do want to make sure that we're going to do whatever we can to help the people on the ground to make sure they're not subject to chemical attacks. We've put a lot of pressure on Russia. Um, there was a um, request by the Secretary General yesterday to the Security Council to do something about what's happening in East Ghouta and to make sure that um, basically he asked for a ceasefire for one month to stop all the parties from fighting. We went together to the Security Council this morning and there was a resolution that was going to deal with that and Russia pushed it off again. We're going to take that to a vote tomorrow and see if they actually are going to follow through. All it would do is cease fire for a month and allow humanitarian access to get in, and they're not doing that. So when you're dealing with a country that's trying to yeah. give cover, yeah. that's a problem. I, I, I hear you. Uh, the reason I asked the question about the military action is because after the president struck Syria, the question was, would there be follow-up actions? Uh, and there haven't been uh, since. Uh, so the question is, uh, is that now likely to be revived as an option because of the frustrations that you're talking about? First, you want proof. Secondly, you don't do strikes easily. That's something that you have to weigh carefully. You have to make sure that it's warranted. You have to see who's going to be on the ground. And I think that the president has made a point of not telling what's going to happen and not having that um, out there for them. But I think that Assad very much knows we will act if we see proof that they have done this. And they're walking a fine line again down that path. One truly tragic byproduct of the Syrian debacle is five million refugees. Uh, I know you visited with these refugees. We just had uh, Justin Trudeau here uh, two weeks ago. Canada has accepted a disproportionate uh, number of refugees, more, more so than the US. And I ask you this as a, the son of a refugee uh, from another time, what is our responsibility as the world's uh, richest and most powerful country to help alleviate this crisis? So we're always um, wanting to help people from other countries, whether they've been persecuted for whatever reason. And there is, I'll go back to my time as governor in South Carolina. Um, we have had a refugee program for a long time that really helped the vulnerable that we would have come in. And South Carolina always participated in that. And one example is when my husband was deployed in Afghanistan, um, there were two interpreters that kept his unit safe. And had they not done that, um, you know, obviously there would be uh, challenges on their end, but if they stayed when the unit left, they would also be killed. So that refugee program, that's the good part of it, is you go and you take care of those that helped our soldiers and did that. Now, when the Syrian refugee situation opened up, as governor, I called uh, Director Comey, who was the FBI director at the time, and I said, okay, we take these in this refugee program. How are the Syrian refugees the same or different? And he said, in the refugee program, we have information. 
in the Syrian refugees, we have nothing. We don't know. We don't have enough information. And at that time, I said, then we can't have them in South Carolina. You can't take a chance of your people not being safe. In the refugee situation, I think the United States always wants to welcome refugees. But I do think at this time in the world, safety and security for the American people is the president's top priority. So he has told his security team, figure out a way to get information on all of these people that we don't have it. And hopefully, we can start to lift that and allow further refugees to come in. But I want to talk about something else, David. When I went to Jordan and Turkey, first of all, the Syrian people have been through so much. But their spirit is amazing. And their skills and their work ethic, all of it's top notch. So even though they are in refugee camps, they have started their own economy. They have cell phone repair stores. They have alteration shops. They have bakeries. They have created a life of their own. And Jordan and Turkey have been amazing hosts in terms of education and health care. The reason why I bring this up is I talk to refugees inside the camp and outside the camp. Not one of them said they wanted to come to the United States. They can see the border. They want to go home. Even if it means they rebuild it with their own hands, they want to go home. And that's what we have to think about with all of those. So what the United States has done is heavily supported Turkey, heavily supported Jordan in being host countries to take care of these refugees so that they can stay close to home. But our ultimate goal is to stop Although this those conduct. countries have said that they've sort of reached their limit uh, for their capacity to handle these refugees. And there's no imminent, because of the situation we talked about, no imminent chance for them to go home. So it well, does create this. I'm not giving up hope on them going home. I think we can't ever give up on that. But the other side of that is when you look at those countries, what we did when I came back was we met with the Jordanian government and the Secretary General. We met with the Turkish government and the Secretary General. And we said, how can we help? Because what the United Nations was doing, what the US was doing, was giving them aid like it was year one of the conflict. Food and water wasn't what they needed anymore. This is year seven of the conflict. It was infrastructure. They needed help with their hospitals. They needed help with their schools, because they were double shifting schools. The Jordanians would go in the morning, and the Syrians would go in the afternoon. Same with the, the Turks. So now we're investing in helping them deal with the pressure of the infrastructure. Well, let me ask you, this is a question from Noah Levin, the class of 2021, uh, related. How is your parents' status as immigrants uh, affected, if at all, your stance on immigration. You, you, your story is well known. Your yes. parents were immigrants from India. Uh, so I, I am very, I always say I'm the proud daughter of Indian parents who reminded my brothers, my sister, and me every day how blessed we were to be in this country. And I know the difference that it made by them coming to the United States and the life that they were able to have for their children. So I see the benefits of what it is. And when you think of America, to have immigration, that's the fabric of America. That's the fabric of America because you have so many gifted and talented people that come into one country celebrating our freedoms, celebrating our hopes and dreams as we go forward. But the United States was built as a country of laws. If we stop following laws, we lose everything this country was based on. And so my parents will be the first ones to tell you, they came here legally, they put in their time, they paid their price, they did it the right way, and they expect the same thing of others that want to come into America, is to go through the same but process. What about proposals that would cut legal immigration by 40%? Are you comfortable with that? Well, I don't know that we're talking 40%, but what I do think we're talking more about is security. What do we do? How do we manage it? The big conversation we're having is not over legal immigration. It's over illegal immigration. And, and all of that migration that's coming in and the, and the pressures that are coming because of it, it would, we have to do everything we can to limit it. We have to make sure that we show them the legal route to come into our country. Anyone that wants to come in legally, the United States is going to welcome. But we have to stop the flow of illegal immigration, because then we're losing actually what we were based on in terms of our laws. What the, uh, the, the debate, the thing that seems to have stopped this, uh, the, the route to uh, compromise has been changes in legal, not illegal immigration. So this, uh, 
Avery Siegel from the class of 2018 said, how do you reconcile your family history with the Trump administration immigration policy, specifically the desire to end so-called chain migration? Look, again, I'll say the same thing. My parents remind us how blessed we are to be here, but they very much strongly believe that this country needs to stand on legal immigration. Mm -hmm. they, they, that, that is, we're talking about legal immigration. No, but if, but if they limit, even with its, the, the chain migration, even if they limit it, that's our laws. For whatever reason, if we decide what we're going to do. But we should need, we, I guess is the question, should we decide that? I think if we decide that, it should only be decided based on security reasons. It mm -hmm. should only be decided on security reasons. And if for any reason we have questions about that, that's something we need to look at. Um, let's talk, talk, turn to North Korea. Uh, Avin Krishnan, uh, the class of 2021, said, uh, what are your thoughts on nuclear deterrence and how does that affect your strategy towards North Korea? So our focus really with North Korea was this has been 25 years in the making where we have seen North Korea build up their nuclear systems. We tell them, the international community tells them to stop. They ask for money. The international community has given them money and then they go back at it again. Our goal now is how do we break that cycle? <clears throat> And the truth is, the cycle can only be broken when we stop the nuclear program altogether. The money that North Korea gets from trade and other things, they don't use it to feed their people. They don't use it to improve the quality of life for their people. They use it to put in their nuclear program. So the point of the sanctions was, if you reduce the revenue that's going to North Korea, you're slowing down the process of their nuclear program. You're cutting the funds they have to continue to build. They clearly are now feeling the pressure. I think that the fact that they're talking with South Korea, their neighbors, they need to get along. That's fine that they talk, but we can never lose sight of the fact we still have an irresponsible um, government in charge of a nuclear program. And until they agree to give that up, and that's full unity of the international community who thinks this, we're going to continue to go down the path where we hold them accountable. You raised some uh, eyes, eyebrows, uh, eyeballs as well, probably, but um, uh, by talking about the prospect or possibility of war, uh, do you think that that possibility has receded at all since the uh, sanctions that you mentioned that were passed in December? I, I think that that possibility is solely on North Korea. I mean, if North Korea continues to say, we've got our missiles aimed at the United States, it, it, they continue with the rhetoric and they continue to talk about how they're going to destroy America, they're not helping themselves. Because our job is to protect ourselves and make sure that they don't hit us or our allies. I think that, you know, really what we have to watch right now is their actions. If they, if they don't do any other testing, if they stop their rhetoric, and if they really look at what the international community is asking them to do, which is denuclearize, then we'll look at something else. But all options have always been on the table when it comes to North Korea. So giving up all their weapons, their missiles, all of it would be... Their, th nucle that. their nuclear program is what we're saying they have to stop. Uh, stop or uh, surrender all of surrender their nuclear... Surrender anything tied to their nuclear program. And if they refuse to do that, uh, the, the, the military option you think is, is a real and viable one. I'm not going to talk about options. I will continue to say everything's on the table. Because most experts say that would be a pretty horrific conflict and that our allies, you mentioned our allies, would pay a big price in terms of hundreds of thousands, perhaps more. I mean, uh, David, is that a viable option? David, nobody wants to go to war. Nobody wants war. And that's always the last option. So everybody, that's a heavy-hearted decision when you decide that you're going to do something. And you only do it when you know there's a real threat. So again, you can talk to any country, ours included. War is always the last option. But this is all up to North Korea. They can either want to be taken back in by the international community, or they can continue to be isolated until they denuclearize. I want to ask you about uh, Russia. Uh, you said um, uh, recently, I guess last fall, I will tell you that when a country can come interfere in another country's elections, that is warfare. It really is because you're making sure that the democracy shifts from what the people want to give uh, to uh, want to giving out that misinformation. 
and we didn't just see it here, you can look at France and you can look at other countries, and there were many, there were Bulgaria, Ukraine, Estonia, uh, Fran uh, you mentioned France, and maybe Brexit. Uh, yeah. uh, and you said they're doing it this everywhere, this is the new, their new weapon of choice, and we have to make sure we get in front of it. You saw the Mueller indictments of the Russians last Friday, which describes in detail exactly what you were talking about. And you said earlier that you, we have an obligation to act on the, uh, on the will of the American people as expressed by Congress. Congress unanimously passed uh, very, very severe sanctions against the Russians as punishment for this very behavior. The administration hasn't yet executed those sanctions. Why? So first of all, I think that we have to be very clear. The Russians did meddle in our elections. There's no question about that. It didn't change the vote. What they did was they tried to influence the narrative, and that's what we have uh, intelligence on, and that's what we know. Having said that, we're starting to see that they are using that as their new level of warfare. They're doing it in other countries, and it's not just the Russians. We're seeing the Iranians are now starting to do it as well, and so I think this is something that the United States is gonna have to start to look very closely at. When it comes to Russia, I wanna point out some things that, that has happened over this past year in reference to Russia. We have greatly expanded our energy capacity we've greatly expanded our military capacity, two things that Russia doesn't want us to do. We've continued to keep the sanctions on Crimea. We have expelled their diplomats. We have continued to put more sanctions on Russia, which the State Department has said have been executed. Um, we continue to put all pressure on Russia. There is no way we are giving even an ounce of breathing time to Russia as long as these issues are there. We just gave the Ukrainians arms in order to protect themselves right. from Russia. So, you know, all of the things that this administration has done towards Russia, they're really strong things. They're really yeah. important things. Not they just don't direct they, related to this, but related to other things. But right. my, my question for you is you just, and you have consistently made a very strong statement about what the Russians did mm -hmm. and, and why we can't tolerate it. Why can't the president do that? David, I think through those actions the president has acted, that's a question you'll have to ask him, right? So I'm here talking about... Well, he's not here until next week, so... <laughs> Look, I mean, I, I think that you're going to have a situation where some say he's not talking enough about Russia and others will say he's talking too much about the elections. My thing is, I'm gonna focus on doing my job and getting the right message out there. When it comes to Russia, it's not about words, it's about actions. The sanctions on Crimea, the arms sold to Ukraine, the fact that we continue to let them know that meddling in elections in our country or any country is not okay, and the fact that we're gonna start to do something about it. So I think, and the sanctions have gone through. I mean- Not this, those sanctions. The, some sanctions. The State Department says they have executed on the sanctions. And again, if you have issues, that's a, that's a Rex Tillerson question. But I He's have, here the following week after the president. <laughs> I have asked Rex, and we have asked the State Department, and they said the sanctions are being implemented. Mm -hmm. So everything that I know that we've done towards Russia, we're following through. I have no problem beating up on Russia. I never have. No, I, I, I know. That's why it's noticeable. You know, I have my style, the president has his style, it's just... Have you been, you're in his national security cabinet, have you been in any meeting directed by the president where you actually discussed what Russia has done and what the steps are going to be to deal with that? Yes. You have? We've talked about our... I'm not going to tell you what we talk about in the National <laughs> Security Council, um, but I will tell you We're that... We're all friends here. But, but I will tell you uh, that, no, as is... A lot of countries, we're talking about what's our strategy to deal with individual countries, and Russia's definitely one of them. Talia Mountjoy of the class of 2018 said, this is a question I've wondered all my life as an Iranian American. What conditions have to exist for us to reestablish diplomatic relations with Iran? And given the Iranian people's desire to be more integrated with the West, do you see that happening anytime soon? 
lastly, is there anything the U.S. can do right now to speed the process along? You know, the Iranian people are finding the power of their voice, and I love that because they're really, you're starting to see protests, you're seeing them really come out against the government, whether it's economic, whether it's human rights, whether it's um, really trying to move their government in a good direction, and the United States continues to support them on that because we think it's, it's very important. Uh, Iran is becoming a really big problem because human rights is the last thing they're thinking about. Terrorism is something they continue to support. We're seeing their involvement with terrorism, whether it's with Hamas in Gaza, we're seeing it in Hezbollah in, in Lebanon, what they're now doing in Syria, causing problems there. They are a problem, and it's not the people, it's the government. And so I, it is a real challenge for the people right now because they're out there, they're protesting, and they're being punished for protesting. But we're going to continue to stand with them. I think that you saw the, the president even spoke um, in their favor at the State of the Union. We're going to do everything we can to help them get to that democratic place they want to be. The things you're talking about are serious and disturbing, but they, they live outside the, uh, the nuclear agreement that was struck between the P5 plus one and, <laughs> and Iran. Do you... Uh, do you think they should be uh, considered uh, and do you, I guess what I'm asking is do you think that we should withdraw from that agreement? So I think, again, human rights, we should always fight for any people that are trying to improve their human rights situation or their quality of life. That's why we continue to support Iran regardless of the of the deal. Well, what, about that's, the, what about the deal? I will get to the deal. Okay. So that's I'm just what looking we'll at do. the clock. I don't wanna... That's what we'll do um, regardless of the deal. When it comes to Iran and when it comes to the agreement, what we're saying with that is this agreement was flawed. They were given billions of dollars and they were supposed to stop nuclear activity, which they have done. They have followed through on what they were supposed to do with the JCPOA plan, but they're violating UN resolutions by continuing to test ballistic missiles by selling arms like they have done to the Houthis in Yemen, and they continue to support terrorism. So when you look at those things, what we're saying is the international community can't be so beholden to this deal that they're going to look away from all of these other bad actions that they're taking. We have to hold them accountable for those actions. We have to make sure that we are still putting pressure on them. And the international community is shaking, saying, no, but they'll get out of the deal. They're not going to get out of the deal. That was the best thing that ever happened to Iran, was they got a ton of money, and they were able to go and start their life over, but continue to do bad things. And so we are putting pressure on Iran that they've got to correct their behavior. And then we are also looking at the part of the deal that has the sunset clause. Because all that deal did, after we gave all of that money and said they couldn't do this, it only lasts 10 to 15 years, basically, where it stops things. We're already three years in. So you're looking, in six or seven years, they're going to be able to do it all over again. And that's not what we want. So the sunset clause needs to be revised. And then the other acts that they continue to do need to be held accountable. The, uh, I, in, in fairness, I think that the international community is concerned about whether we're going to withdraw from the agreement as much as whether they're going to withdraw from the agreement. You see our allies uh, have been very vocal about this who, are, who joined in this agreement. And so, our allies are helping us right now focus in on the ballistic missile testing and looking at the sunset clause and looking at these other things. And so all we're saying is improve the situation. But if you don't improve the situation and you still have all of these negatives, why would we stay in if it's a false narrative? You've created a false story that they're not abiding to. And so, um, look, the president will decide whether we get in, stay in the deal or get out of the deal. But I can tell you two things he very much cares about is um, the violations, which the secretary general acknowledged the violations, support of terrorism, arms sales, which they're under an arms embargo and not supposed to, and then you've got their um, support of terrorism, arms sales, and then also making sure that they continue to um, be involved with terrorist groups and, and those things. We, it's got to stop. The ballistic missile testing has got to stop. So even though they're abiding by the agreement itself, these other activities would be justification potentially for leaving the agreement? These other activities are a big deal. I mean, they just gave the Houthis missiles that were launched 
from Yemen yeah. into no, Saudi Arabia. I'm not belittling I mean, that at all. I mean, I know they're a big deal. I'm just asking, would they be justification for getting out of the agreement? I think that if, if we don't see improvements in this, I think that we're living a false narrative by thinking that we should stay in the agreement and all is going to be well in the world in seven years. We can't be okay with that. I, uh, we've got a few minutes left. I cannot uh, leave here without asking you this question from Owen Merck of the class of 2022. How do you feel the president's Twitter has affected diplomatic relations with other nations? And the reason I wanted to ask you yeah. this is, I have to imagine there are mornings that you wake up and you pick up your phone and say, oh my, <laughs> this, this is gonna be a different day than I had planned on. More times than I can tell you. I mean, it's without question. Look, I mean, I think that, um, you know, as governor, I used social media quite a bit. It's a great way to interact directly with the people you serve and get their feedback. And so I can see where it can be very powerful. This clearly is a president who likes social media. And so for <laughs> everybody that, you know, doesn't like his tweets, it's not going to stop. It's who he is. It's what he does. Do does I it make your job harder? It makes it interesting. <laughs> I mean, I think it's interesting in that when I wake up, I don't know what he's going to tweet about. Um, so, you know, you're always kind of moving through life um, with his tweets in mind. But having said that, um, I've found in the UN, they're like glued to his tweets. So everything he says or does, they take seriously, and that's the president speaking. So it takes out the media, it takes out everything else, and that's the president speaking. So they take every word he says seriously, and they react accordingly. So if we're trying to push something against chemical weapons and he puts something out there, they take that very seriously. If we say Russia's stopping what we're trying to do in Syria, I mean, they take that very seriously. So you didn't know little rocket man was coming, huh? I actually did. Um, <laughs> Wasn't your idea, was it? No, no, no. It? no. Well, you know, I say that he um, he tweeted it um, out, so I didn't know it was coming then. Mm -hmm. So I saw it in, in the Twitter. But he had to give the UN um, big speech oh, yes, at yeah. the General Assembly, and he called me that morning and he said, I, "I said, okay, now, Mr. President, you need to understand, this is a serious crowd." <laughs> They're not going to rally. They're not going to cheer. That's just not who these people are. So don't take it the wrong way. And so that was the, the first thing. And then um, I said, just think of it as church. You're, you're speaking in, to church. <laughs> and so then he went and he said, well, I got to ask you, what do you think about me saying Little Rocket Man in the speech? And you said, would you say that in church? I said, <laughs> I said well, it's kind of a formal crowd. Um, it would be different. And he said, I think it's catchy. I think it works. But this is the thing. After he said it at the General Assembly, literally, heads of state are referring to him as a little rocket man. I am getting all, I had an African president that I met with right after, and he's not even using Kim's name. He's calling him little rocket man. So it, you know, it, it works. No, he does. He, he appends names to people for sure. Yes, he does. So I, I can't. I, as we close, um, we, we've just gone through a national, another national trauma down in Florida. I know you personally dealt with this as a governor, and I wanted to ask you about that, you know, the uh, horrific shooting in Charleston and uh, the aftermath of that. Do you see this as a kind of tipping point? Do you think that there is an opportunity here for some meaningful changes, uh, both in terms of how uh, we deal with guns in the law and other aspects of this problem? I mean, look, having lived through a tragedy like that and, and dealt with it on a firsthand basis, there's no way that you can imagine the suffering that is happening right now, the trauma that's happening. It, the part about these things that frustrate me are that people like to say things about them and then when they go off television, people forget about them. And these were people's lives that were affected. I can only tell you from my personal situation, when we had the Charleston tragedy, the state was broken. Our hearts were broken. Because here you had 
11 amazing people who did what South Carolinians do all the time on Wednesdays. They went to Bible study. But on this day, someone who didn't look like them, didn't act like them, and didn't sound like them walked in. They didn't call the cops. They didn't throw him out. They pulled up a chair and prayed with him for an hour. So the idea that that could happen was unimaginable. And in South Carolina, they, the people were just broken. All people were broken. What I knew was really important as the governor was I had to make sure that we put our arms around the people of South Carolina and keep outside influences going. So for example, um, because when a tragedy happens, the first reaction is political, the very first reaction. We were going through, a, a, I think, a presidential election at the time. I told all presidential candidates, stay out of this. This is not your conversation to be had right now. I told um, Jesse Jackson, who had come to South Carolina, and Al Sharpton. Um, I had breakfast with Reverend Jackson every day and said, you can talk to me, but do not talk to the press. Um, and the same with Al Sharpton. And I said, out of respect for the families. And then we went through the funerals. Let them go through the funerals. Let them hurt. Let them cry. Let them do. But when you insert politics that close after, you're putting those families in situations that are really more traumatic. So when we got through the funerals, then there was a conversation to be had. And I did ask for the Confederate flag to come down. And that was another process of keeping people tight. The reason why I say that is when you see a shooting like what happened in Florida, yes, a lot should be done. But the problem I have from having lived it is everybody's quick to say one thing is going to fix it. And that's just not right. When you look at the Charleston tragedy, that killer was never supposed to have that gun. But the FBI didn't do the background check in the seven days that they needed to do it. So he got that gun. He wouldn't have gotten it otherwise because he had something on his record. So you've got that aspect that we really have to go into the background checks. You've got the second aspect of social media. We need our social media. We need the group, just like we're doing with the elections, to look for things like that. The Charleston killer had things all over his page with guns and Confederate flags and white supremacist things. Nobody caught it. These are things that you have to do. Then you go and you can have the conversation about um, what guns you can or can't have. That's always a conversation you can do. But the Second Amendment is part of the Constitution. And you can work with age limits and all of those things. But at the end of the day, it is the Second Amendment. And I think we have to think bigger than what's happening. It's not about what age somebody gets a gun. It's about, OK, now, in schools, what are we going to do, just like we did after 9-11, when we did airports, we need to look at what we're going to do in school. So there's so many things. It's not just about guns. There needs to be a full level conversation from the start to the end on every aspect that affects a child in a school when it comes to safety. But one thing isn't going to fix it. It's got to be everybody invested. It's going to take a lot. It's going to take resources. It's going to take time. It's going to take efforts. I mean, look, this kid in Florida, they had been to his house 39 times. Did anybody ever think to see that his dad had died years ago and his mom just died in November? I mean, there's, where were, you know, if there was a mental health history, who was watching him? These are, so it's a bigger conversation. And so I get frustrated when you've got this massive tragedy that changes lives and everybody wants to politically talk about it, but you gotta talk about it in so much more depth. You have to talk about it from the aspect that we are all responsible. Every one of us are responsible. We need to change every aspect of what we do and how we live because this is the life now. And we've got to make sure that everybody realizes whether you see it, whether you hear it, whether you were a part of the government process that was 
that placed him in that home, whether you were part of the FBI that had the background checks, whether you're a social media CEO and you realize these things are happening under your watch, every one of us has an obligation. Only then will we really get to the heart of these shootings. Well, I, I think most people watch these splendid young kids down in Florida who are part of this tragedy, who are speaking out. And my hope is for their sake that uh, we do more than talk about this stuff this time and then we actually do meaningful things about it. I'm sure you share that. Well, you know what I love is I love seeing them use the power of their voice. I really do. And I think that it is incumbent on us to get that energy that they have with the power of their voice to have a bigger conversation. I want them to talk about social media. I want us to talk about how we're going to monitor social media. I want them to talk about how we deal with mental health in America and how we're going to deal with this. I want to talk about the system that lets you down when you've got this kid who was visited 39 times all and nobody. All, I want the kids talking about all of it. And you can talk about gun control, but talk about all of it. Because that's the real conversation is the obligation of everybody to be a part of the solution. Well, we so appreciate you sharing this time Thank with you. us and uh, you're using your voice. Thank you. Uh, and uh, hope you'll come back again. Absolutely. Thank Happy you so birthday. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.